So, uh, uh, so uh, dear friends in uh, Tbilisi, Brussels, Tallinn, and elsewhere, uh, I'm very glad to welcome you warmly here uh, at the webinar uh, arranged jointly between Georgian Foundation for Strategic and uh, International Studies, the Rondeli Foundation, and the Estonian uh, School uh, of Diplomacy. Um, if I may start a bit on a, on a personal note, then, uh, then uh, my connection with the uh, Rondelli Foundation and uh, Georgia's kind of European uh, appro approximation process goes back to 2006 when I, I joined the JEPLAC uh, team, uh, Georgian Foundation, uh, uh, JEPLAC Georgian European Policy and Legal Advice Team. Uh, to, to work with Georgians on Georgia's EU approximation process. And, uh, and I've been involved there uh, ever since. And, uh, and uh, so it's quite appropriate to go today into discussions about uh, where Georgia stands right now as far as uh, EU approximation process is concerned. Uh, Estonia has always supported uh, Georgia's aspirations, uh, but the process is difficult, as we all know, and there are different obstacles on the way. And uh, yeah, this is what we will be discussing uh, uh, today. Uh, we have two excellent, excellent speakers today um, to make initial presentations. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Sven Mixer. Uh, he has been Estonia's foreign minister. He has been Estonia's minister for defense. And uh, right now he's the member of the uh, European Parliament. And uh, he's very intimately involved with Georgia because he's also the, the rapporteur on uh, EU association agreement with Georgia. So he knows the details, the thinking in, in, in Brussels and uh, I'm glad that Sven is uh, willing to, uh, to share it uh, with us today. And, uh, and uh, the, the other speaker is uh, Ambassador Natalie Sabanadze. Uh, well, she has an extensive background in, in research in, in Georgia, US, uh, Oxford, UK. He has worked for OSCE and of course, most of you, I mean, the people who have joined us here today in the, in the webinar then, uh, know her as a, a long-time uh, ambassador of Georgia uh, or head of the Georgian mission to the, uh, to the European Union. So um, both of the speakers will, will make uh, brief remarks and then after that uh, we will hopefully have an excellent questions and answers or a discussion round and, uh, and, uh, and uh, well, the, the, the people involved here have so much experience, so I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to uh, excellent uh, discussions. But first of all, then I will, I will hand uh, the floor to, uh, to Mr., uh, Mr. Mixer, please, yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Eka, and I would uh, like to uh, start by uh, thanking the organizers, both from the Estonian side, the Estonian School of Diplomacy, as well as the Rondelli Foundation for putting together this event uh, well, it's it's obviously a very timely timely uh, discussion, a uh, very topical uh, issue, and uh, I'm just actually um, back from a couple of uh, floors uh, below here in the European Parliament from meeting the uh, newly elected speaker of the uh, of the Georgian Parliament, who is uh, currently paying his uh, his his first uh, visit in this role uh, to the uh, to 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 the. Um, European capitals, starting from Brussels. So um, I think that uh, that we've seen over the past several years a constant stream of high-level Georgian delegations to the uh, uh, European institutions. And I think it's not just a sort of political exercise, it, it, it truly reflects uh, the overwhelming support uh, uh, not only of Georgian political establishment and, and political parties, but also of the Georgian population uh, to, to, to the country's Euro, European and Euro Atlantic aspirations. And, and these are uh, absolutely legitimate aspirations. Uh, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's duly uh, appreciated here in Brussels and also in, in many European capitals. 
there's an overwhelming support in the European Parliament uh, to to uh, deepening the relationship with Georgia. Although I would I would I would probably have to say that. Uh, uh, there are some diverging views as to as to how fast and how far this uh, process of bringing Georgia together to the to the EU should uh, should should go, and and um, obviously uh, as we as we like to say, well, uh, the the uh, uh, aspirations they are for the for the any individual country who is seeking a relationship with the European Union uh, to, to 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 define. Uh, but but uh, it's it's up to the European Union. Uh, it's a, it's a political decision by the European Union member states and European institutions as to as to how the how the actual ap approximation process uh, proceeds and and how far it uh, it, it leads. And that's um, well. Uh, the, the relationship that Georgia is enjoying today with the European Union, it's an, uh, a relationship of an associated country. It's a very special level of relationship, but obviously falls short of, 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 of membership by a quite significant uh, margin. And, and uh, well, uh, Georgia is also one of the uh, one of the eastern partners of the of the European Union. Uh, this is another uh, kind of special relationship that the uh, Union has with its uh, closest neighborhood, but obviously it is not uh, Eastern Partnership is not uh, to be uh, mixed up with the with the with the, with enlargement, which is a wholly separate policy uh, policy area. Uh, Georgia today uh, is not officially a, a European Union candidate country. Uh, this is a, a a status that is awarded by the Union to those countries that. That the team to be ready for 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 negotiating the membership, uh, well, chapter by chapter in 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 a number of policy areas. But even that is obviously not a guarantee of of, of being able to join at any 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 clearly defined uh, date. Uh, so it's 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 a very complex issue. But um, I think that that while the uh, uh, Achieve, uh, while achieving the eventual goal, which in Georgia's case clearly is full membership of the European Union, uh, it, it uh, is conditioned on the ability of the country to uh, to fulfill certain criteria in different policy uh, policy areas. It's also a political decision by the Union, and and here um, obviously the conditions will have to be uh, will have to be right, and they do not really uh, depend 100% of the country's readiness to 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 accede. Uh, so it's it's a complex sort of um, uh, complex co very very complex issue, but what is important I would say for Georgia is uh, uh, to to have the uh, uh, homework done to be prepared when the conditions are right uh, for the political eventual political step of of of, of coming in. Uh, well, I think this is this is the critical critical thing to understand, and and being right, uh, be, being ready, uh, being uh, or having the homework done, obviously consists of having uh, important socio-economic reforms completed, or at least advanced to a certain stage, uh, having the uh, the political democratic political reforms uh, advanced to a sufficient uh, state. Uh, and 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 also I think uh, demonstrating that those reforms are uh, sustainable, including the uh, demonstrating or convincing the European Union that that uh, uh, the, uh, the the country and its political establishment is sort of mature enough to to function sustain in a sustainable manner as a member of the of the, of the European Union. Uh, as as I said, it's not only for the up to, up to up to uh, Georgia's progress. Or it's only only dependent on Georgia's progress. Obviously, uh, the the internal condition of the European Union, uh, and and the internal political developments in the in the EU member states, especially the big and big and powerful EU member states, uh, determine the readiness of the Union to go on with any any sort of uh, enlargement at all. Uh, so, so that's that's another thing to observe. Um, uh, I would I would uh, uh, also remark that 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 actually the the success or the perceived success of previous rounds of enlargement plays a very 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 critical role here, because um, uh, we we are, we are seeing that. Uh, um, well, even though I I don't think it's entirely appropriate at this point in time to. 
uh, divide the European Union into old and new member states, uh, um, there, there is some unhappiness and some unease in, in, in large European capitals with, with uh, how the, how the uh, most recent uh, entries to the Union are uh, conducting their affairs, especially with regard to the, the democracy and rule of law. And uh, well, there, there might be uh, sometimes there are allegations that there, there are double standards and things are not significantly better in some of the of the older and, and supposedly more politically mature member states. But, but nonetheless, this is uh, also also a, a, a factor. Obviously, um, uh, the no no third country uh, should have a say in in uh, the in the. Uh, uh, Relationship between the uh, Georgia, between the European Union and Georgia, or the, um, uh, regarding the the potential membership of Georgia in the European Union, uh, but uh, there is, in practical terms, there is little doubt that uh, that uh, regional tensions and and political instabilities uh, uh, in the world, but but especially in the in the in the closest geographical neighborhood of, of, of Georgia play a, a, a role. So I think that Georgia has this very, very big stake in, in very many respects also in the, in, in the regional stability. Uh, just to, uh, well, these days, uh, the uh, foreign minister of Georgia has has signed an agreement with the other other uh, two associated uh, Eastern partners to to uh, deep, uh, deepen the cooperation uh, with the with the goal of coming closer to the European Union, I think it uh, it is uh, not that dissimilar to to to, to the way the we the Baltic countries uh, cooperated among the, ourselves before joining the European Union. I think it's it's uh, it, it it is potentially a good way of of uh, demonstrating the uh, the uh, ability to 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 cooperate and, and and to gain sort of positive visibility also in the European Union uh, so so there are there are ways uh, beside uh, just uh, those uh, political uh, and and socioeconomic reforms to demonstrate the readiness to function in the future as as, as a member and uh, and well uh, i probably should sum up here uh, at a later point perhaps we may may come back to in in more detail to to the uh, recent political uh, internal political developments because the internal domestic politics in in georgia has been extremely turbulent and and obviously uh, greater predictability and stability in, in 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 running domestic affairs, including elections, including uh, uh, the uh, functioning of judiciary, and so on. They, they, these are also important aspects uh, uh, that the uh, Europeans keep very close eye on. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mixer. And uh, and actually, as we speak here uh, today, then. The freshly appointed Parliament Speaker of, of Georgia, Kaka Kuchawa, is uh, visiting Brussels, and uh, I understand he has met uh, Parliament's Vice President Clara Dobrev, and uh, and uh, well, uh, they, they discussed uh, Georgia's plan to apply for the European Union membership in uh, 2024, and uh, and also the implementation of the EU brokered uh, April 19 deal, which Mr. Uh, Mixer was uh, just referring to. So. Um, yeah, these these are all very kind of uh, uh, fresh points, and uh, and uh, these should be uh, kept in mind while while having this uh, discussion uh, this discussion today. For the attendees of the uh, of the webinar, uh, I, I I propose you put your questions to the speakers uh, through the questions and answers or the chat uh, screen uh, of uh, of Zoom, and and then we will we will uh, handle uh, handle the questions uh, after uh, Ms. Savanadze's presentation. So so uh, yes, please, Ms. Savanadze, what is your take on the current state of affairs uh, in in Georgia's uh, European uh, path. Thank you very much, Edgar. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, webinar, and I want to thank the uh, Estonia School of uh, Diplomacy and Rondeli Foundation. I want to say hello to my friends at uh, Rondeli Foundation, whom I don't see, but uh, as I mentioned to you, this is a place which is very dear to my heart. Uh, thanks to Alex Rondeli, who was uh, my professor and in many ways defined uh, my path in life. 
Um, with regards to uh, Georgia and European Union, um, at this point, and you said uh, at, at the beginning uh, to sort of summarize where we are, I think we can say uh, definitely that Georgia today is closer to the European Union than it has ever been before. We have built over time extensive social, political, bureaucratic, economic linkages uh, with the EU, uh, the framework that we have is the association agreement, which is comprehensive, really far reaching and includes a free trade agreement. We have uh, visa liberalization um, and basically the, the groundwork is there to uh, advance forward. And in some ways, I suppose the logical continuation of this was the declared uh, wish uh, of uh, the uh, ruling party in Georgia to apply for the membership in 2024. Uh, without taking uh, into consideration the difficult context which Sven referred to, uh, this um, ambition may be dangerous because we are putting a specific date on it, but at the same time, it can serve as a mobilizing power if it is there to, uh, to push forward uh, reforms to make Georgia more prepared, uh, then why not? But uh, the recent protracted um, crisis has raised some doubts about the readiness of the political elite to do this, but there is definitely a, a great support for that in, uh, among the Georgian public. If we were to summarize the situation on the EU side towards Georgia's European future, I think we can do it in one sentence. I mean, there is no consensus about uh, giving Georgia European perspective within the EU among member states, but equally there is no consensus about denying it. So um, this ambiguity, while itself is not ideal, it's better than an outright rejection. The danger with the 24 is that if Georgia applies unprepared, it risks the rejection, which may have dramatic consequences. So we do need to prepare. And I will echo now very much to what Sven had already repair, uh, referred to. Um, but uh, we have to take into account that uh, this uh, move of Georgia, our ambitions, um, are going to take place in a very difficult uh, context. And there are, I would uh, single out two main defining features uh, of this context that I think will have an impact on how European Union looks at its contenders and the future contenders uh, such as Georgia. One is disillusionment with enlargement that has been mentioned by Sven and the other is the kind of return of geopolitics. Um, when it comes to uh, the enlargement process, many commentators have even declared it dead, despite promises to the contrary and their candidate states. Uh, this has before been considered as one of the most successful policies of the European Union, but the, the approach the kind of attitude is changing, partly arguably due to the kind of backsliding that is taking place um, in some of the new uh, member states. And there is a growing disillusionment perhaps and the questioning whether enlargement has been a good thing for the European project. So under the circumstances, before we had a kind of a traditional paradigm, like uh, for instance, when Estonia uh, joined, uh, the, the traditional paradigm is that first you get association agreement, then a membership perspective, and then chapter by chapter preparation for, uh, for membership. I think in our case, uh, I may be wrong, but this is my impression after eight years being in Brussels, is that we, cannot expect exactly the same pattern to um, happen. I think we can actually expect a reversal of the paradigm in which Georgia as a contender first has to be prepared and then expect a candidate status. Um, and this preparation is not going to be easy, but we know what it entails. I mean, we can follow the uh, we can follow the experience of Estonia, for example, which has been one of the most successful uh, countries and has always been at the forefront, uh, also during the uh, accession process. 
It also means that we have to be a bit more creative and think how we can move forward, how we can make another step, which is more than association, but perhaps less than membership because we don't have it, in order to keep coming closer to the EU and becoming like a non-member member state, basically. Um, and this will uh, increase, obviously, our chances. Uh, in practical terms, this, of course, means reforms. Uh, this means uh, creating uh, conditions back home uh, where there are basically no question marks about uh, domestic situation, about domestic democratic development. Uh, European Union is still a, a union which is based on common values. And I have uh, said that before, Georgia needs to build a very strong moral case saying that it simply cannot be morally justified to deny uh, perspective to a country like Georgia. We're not there yet, but I think we have to be, uh, in, in, we have to develop in a way that will make it difficult for skeptics to, to, um, to reject. It will kind of be morally uncomfortable for them to, uh, uh, to consider rejection. And for me, this is a sine qua non precondition. I would not say that this is sufficient. Uh, and uh, the second factor that I mentioned was this kind of return of geopolitics. I mean, where we are in Georgia and Estonia as well, we've never been very naive about uh, geopolitical competition that is taking place. Um, and for us, it is and has always been a geopolitical choice to come closer to the EU, European, Euro Atlantic integration. But also from the EU side, I think after Crimean annexation, and I would even say starting from the Vilnius summit of the uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, there has been a growing realization that the Eastern neighborhood is a battlefield of power political competition. Uh, and, um, and we have to respond to it somehow. And the EU also has now more and more accepting this uh, notion. And as you know, the, it's been declared that we now have a geopolitical commission and so on. So this means that we also have to make a case which is strategic and geopolitical. Uh, that it is uh, in the interest of the European Union that Georgia joins. Now, um, when we, the kind of, um, for the moment, the EU perceives as uh, the, the geopolitical nature of this uh, policy perceives it as, as being um, costly. And I think it has, uh, um, it has made it more cautious and more wary of perhaps unintended consequences. Now, when you enter, when you speak about uh, power political competition, I think it doesn't necessarily or exclusively means confrontation. But when you talk about competition in principle, the um, expectation is that you enter it with the desire to win, right? But what and how do we define the win is an interesting case. And there, I think we have, it is in our interest to make the case that for the European Union, Georgia inside is more of a win uh, than a loss. And there are many arguments for this, but this I think needs to be further uh, developed and, uh, and built. And uh, I, I will stop here and then if necessary, we can go into, uh, into greater details. But in sum, we have to pursue this kind of dual track policy, dual track vision, which is on the one hand to have very strong moral case and strategic case. And this will also have to have clear domestic and external dimension. Domestic is clear what needs to be done on, in terms of reforms. Uh, externally, I think we have to be more active in uh, contributing to a uh, general conversation about the security, European security, to kind of make uh, our uh, policy not so much Georgia-centered, which it will be always, but also to think about what is in the overall European interests when we are putting forward certain arguments. Um, and uh, part of the external kind of galvanizing support is, of course, making friends among member states. We have friends like Estonia, but we need, uh, we need a kind of a greater alliance of those who will be pushing for, uh, for Georgia to, um, to come closer. All of this is, of course, complicated, but as a, as a kind of an outline and the vision, the way I see it, uh, based on my experience and exchanges that I've had over these years, um, this is what I wanted to share. 
thank you, thank you so much, Miss uh, Sabanaza. Um, you, you, you both uh, mentioned Eastern Partnership briefly in your uh, in your remarks. Would you would you like to elaborate a bit? How do you see Eastern Partnership to work in the future? I mean, and and also for Georgia, would the supposedly uh, uh, put forward application uh, in 24, would it change Georgia's attitude towards the Eastern Partnership and 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 uh, taken the geopolitics, as uh, Ms. Sabanansa mentioned, that does, does Eastern Partnership has a future? Are you, are you willing to comment on, on, on Eastern Partnership? If I, if I may. Uh, well, obviously, I mean, uh, if or when uh, Georgia achieves candidate status, then its relationship with the European Union would be uh, significantly transformed. Uh, with regard to Eastern Partnership, I think that that it's uh, it's part of the U European neighborhood policy, and in some way, it, it, it's, it's sort of uh, is a competition for for visibility and for resources with the with the Southern Partnership or Southern neighborhood of the European Union. Uh, but it's 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 obviously it's not 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 only that. I think that that Eastern Partnership has uh, has given uh, the 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 six countries sort of more more visibility uh, collectively uh, in in Brussels and in European capitals. It's also contributed, I think, in very meaningful ways when it comes to, uh, for example, uh, improving connectivity and 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 certain other very tangible tangible things. We all know that the main political, um, uh, there are some very significant com political complications uh, with, the, with, the, with the Eastern Partnership. Uh, one is that the countries, the, the, the six countries who are, belong to that group, uh, they have uh, very uh, different uh, ambitions, or aspirations. They, the, 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 uh, the way they, they describe these sort of uh, uh, aspired degree of association or, or, or relationship with the European Union are, are very, very different. There are those like Georgia who, who are uh, openly saying they, they, they uh, uh, aspire for full membership in the European Union. There are others who have never expressed even in remotely a similar degree of aspiration. Uh, and, and also we know that there are, well, obviously very, very, uh, uh, Sort of uh, the, 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 for example, the conflict between the uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan obviously complicates the, the the smooth functioning on on the on the political level of the of the Eastern partnership and uh, including when it comes to, for example, the the uh, well political declarations of the summit meetings and and so on, uh, and 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 then there's uh, there's uh, Belarus uh, the, that is often described as last last dictatorship in Europe. Uh, which obviously by democratic credentials is is uh, uh, well very very far from from some of the more more, more advanced members of this group. But still, I, th I think that keeping this uh, this grouping together uh, is 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 important uh, and and helps actually successfully compete for uh, for the for the for the European European resources that are allocated for those very tangible projects and initiatives. So it's it it has its value, uh, but. But, but obviously, when it comes to enlargement or the potential enlargement of the union, uh, then uh, Eastern Partnership is not enlargement, uh, and and uh, it cannot be used, and it will it, it will never be used as sort of backdoor into the European Union. Uh, so and 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 that's very clear. At the same time, I think it's very important, and I've been often saying this: uh, Eastern Partnership should not be used as a way of keeping uh, those those countries away from the European Union or from eventual membership. Uh, so uh, it should not uh, be seen as a as a, as a substitute, whatever, uh, even e even if it uh, sort of significantly develops and advances, uh, which well, obviously is is is. Uh, it's not a foregone conclusion, but but it 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 will not be. It, 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 I, I don't think it can be a sort of alternative for membership for those countries that aspire for membership. So it's uh, it has future, but obviously, uh, I think it we we, we make or must ha make a very clear separation between Eastern Partnership and enlargement policy. Mm. Ms. Sabanaza, anything on that? Uh, yeah, I can add a few words. Um, uh, I agree with Sven. Um, I think Eastern Partnership is something that, uh, for the moment, where we are now uh, in the current situation for Georgia, is a policy 
which is of great importance. And it has clearly brought us much closer to the EU. Without Eastern partnership, we were further away. And that, one can say, applies to all six different degrees according to their own different uh, ambitions. Now, the six is a very varied uh, bunch. Uh, and they all have different uh, visions to how close they want to get to the European Union. But that in itself, uh, for me, is not a problem. I think that in itself, if managed well, is, uh, uh, is also very important. And from the point of view of Georgia, it's important. Because, I mean, let's face it, for us, strategically, it is our national security interest to have our immediate neighbors, such as Armenia and Azerbaijan, even if they don't want and they don't have the same uh, far-reaching ambitions in relation with the EU, but to have them closer to the EU as opposed to closer to Russia. So in that sense, even for, for, for us, Eastern Partnership is uh, extremely important and we should uh, absolutely continue to support it and continue for, uh, to support it for the six, precisely for, from, from, for, for that reason. Uh, but that also doesn't mean that it has to become a straight jacket or a kind of a break to our uh, ad uh, advancement. And this is where the idea of differentiation comes in, that you know, uh, different partners can move according to their own different uh, speed and sort of different uh, ambitions. Um, in that sense, I think what has happened in Kiev yesterday, which is a kind of a creation of the associated members, uh, uh, and the signing of between the foreign ministers is a very welcome step. And this we may see as now we can take that out of Eastern partnership and it can have now life of its own. I mean, we depend how it will uh, develop, but these three countries all share the same vision, so to say, they want to uh, become members. And uh, the, the creation of this uh, trio perhaps can also be useful in, in a sense to separate Eastern partnership, which is non-enlargement policy with uh, something else that can be developed um, and that can be more focused on uh, further approximation or eventual uh, enlargement. And I think this, uh, the, the, the more uh, clear the separation is, then the more clear we look at what one can deliver as opposed to what it cannot deliver. I think that's also important and what the other can do I think that's a, that's a good thing. And I mentioned that we need to be creative in sort of finding ways how to get closer to the EU. And this, uh, this group of three is one way to, to do it. I mean, I, there's no guarantee how it will work, but we can, we can think about it, of course, and, uh, and, and inject a kind of momentum uh, in it and also develop, uh, understand, develop ideas on how the EU can respond to this. So far, this is an, uh, this is an our initiative, and now we have to think of how to engage with the EU and kind of generate um, the relevant responses. Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, Natalie. Actually, Alex Petrashvili also already put the question. Yeah, I saw it, yeah. uh, you, you saw the question, right? But uh, Alex's question was also kind of maybe more uh, aimed at, uh, at what would be uh, EU's response. Are you, Sven, willing to elaborate a bit on, on, uh, on, on how EU sees the yesterday's kind of declaration or the, the, the trio announcement? Um, would it somehow further uh, the process? How, how is it seen from, uh, from, from Brussels and from, from EU side? Uh, well, I think that uh, yesterday's uh, signatures on the, on the, on the, on the three-year agreement uh, of the three volume foreign ministers, that's a very, very recent thing. So I, I, th I think that, that um, it's, it's perhaps a bit premature to say what, what the EU collectively thinks of that or, or how, it, how the EU collectively sees its potential. Uh, but, but as I said, uh, there are uh, virtues of the Eastern Partnership and, and as uh, Natalie said, well, uh, Georgia, for example, uh, does not share a land border with the other two associated countries, but when it comes to connectivity projects, then obviously this Eastern Partnership has its uh, sort of uh, advantages in order to promote trade and, and, and connectivity. Uh, at the same time, it's, uh, it's, uh, th th there are uh, ways of uh, developing uh, closer cooperation uh, between the three associated Eastern partners uh, so as to demonstrate to the Euro European Union 
uh, the uh, both the sort of political will to go ahead with the approximation and uh, and integration, as well as the ability to do so. Uh, so uh, I I have compared that to the uh, to the to the way we cooperated uh, uh, among the three Baltic countries ahead of our accession to the European Union, and it was not uh, necessarily something that was sort of uh, for, uh, in or formats that were created or or. or uh, imposed on us by the European Union, it was our our own sort of creativity, but it it's, it uh, served both to to uh, prepare ourselves for the eventual membership as well as uh, as uh, to demonstrate to the European Union that we are, we were able to function uh, in a way that would sort of make us uh, suitable candidates for eventual membership. So uh, there are there, there are benefits. I don't think that anyone anyone um, uh, sort of questions that. Um, there are obviously different different uh, perspectives as to how this uh, uh, development should sort of affect uh, the uh, the uh, future of the Eastern Partnership, whether 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 this sort of trio uh, trio project should uh, uh, in the future function as a part of the Eastern Partnership or or, or, or separately from the from from the from the Eastern Partner Partnership, and 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 I can uh, understand some of the concerns that perhaps the the non-associated Eastern partners like Armenia might 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 have about uh, about this TRIO project, uh, but but as I, as I said at the beginning, it's it's up to each and every country to define their own level of ambition and level of aspiration, and these are fully 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 legitimate. And I don't think that that the because some of the Eastern partners have never uh, expressed the, uh, a, a wish to become part of the European Union, that it, it should keep the others uh, away. So that's my brief response. Um, yes, indeed. It, it also reminded me, I mean, yesterday's trio, uh, trio approach, right? It also reminded me so much of, of, of the Baltic uh, uh, way to, to, to approach the European Union. And I, I do vividly remember also the, the, let's say, friendly competition between uh, the Baltic states while kind of uh, uh, closing the chapters. And uh, I, I hope the, the friendly competition is also there between uh, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, which, which will, uh, will inspire and, uh, and in inspire you to, to, to take uh, uh, further steps in, in your inter integration process. Uh, but here I would now uh, also like to welcome uh, an old friend, uh, Ambassador Kirsti Narinen. Uh, uh, she was the former um, Finnish ambassador to Tallinn and, uh, and I, I, I suppose her question is targeted uh, at, uh, at, at Natalie because uh, well, um, as Kirsty mentions here, that uh, Georgia and Georgians strongly support EU and NATO integration, but uh, but but perhaps Natalie, you would kind of elaborate on what the European identity actually means to the Georgians. Mm. Uh, thank you very much. It is a really interesting. Um... And a complex question, which I don't think I can answer in, in five minutes. Um, but uh, I think it has obviously historical background, uh, but it also has uh, more contemporary political, one can even say instrumental dimension to it. Now, uh, when Georgia was kind of uh, being defined as a nation, and we, we know there are many different uh, theories about it, and the history of Georgia goes back a long, long time ago, but the idea of a modern nation is a very European creation, and the forefathers of the Georgian nation, in a modern sense, really perceived it and followed the European pattern. So in a way, already then at the beginning of the 19th century and of 18th century, the, the ideas of Georgia, uh, Georgian hood as, as a modern nation followed the European pattern. Um, and in many respects, our myths, our approach, our, uh, uh, our ideals are the ones that are shared across the spectrum, across the European nations that we, we feel we belong to as, uh, as part of the, the same family. Um, when Georgia became independent, uh, for it lasted only for three years, unfortunately, in your case, it was a bit longer. 
and there is now growing interest towards the first republic i think that was very clearly that that period was a very clear manifestation of this continuation of European Georgian nationhood that was being conceived Georgian uh, as a European identity and, and the way it, it received political expression in the First Republic because it was by today's standards even uh, a, a very progressive European state and had the uh, disaster of the Soviet Union not happened I think there would never be a question about Georgia's European identity. Uh, but at the same time, I have to say that uh, when we say Georgians feel European or are European, it does not necessarily mean that we are European in the same way, for instance, as the French are or as Estonians are. You know, there are many differences and the identity is in many ways um, a, a, a fluid uh, concept. There's a lot of self de definition. Uh, and Georgians are where they are, which is at the very, very edge of Europe, where it had historically a lot of influence from uh, from the east. And uh, at certain, at some point, a kind of a, uh, it got uh, taken away. It got um, uh, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, it lost that connection in, in, in uh, historically with Europe and was kind of. Uh, um, more associated with uh, with the outside, but despite this, uh, the the idea of Georgia as being historically and politically destined to be a part of Europe forms part of the Georgia's national myth, basically. So that, of course, feeds the the understanding of uh, how we see and perceive ourselves. There are competing um, uh, kind of uh, the discourses, but they have never really taken off. And I think there is a reason for that. And the reason is kind of cultural and historical, but you know, I'm not, a, uh, I, I am somebody who believes in the constructive nature of all this. And also in the, the way we now promote that side of our identity is of course also very political because uh, we, we want to show the European uh, part of our identity in order to achieve a political uh, objective, which, which is European and Euro-Atlantic membership. So there, there is this interconnection. But as I said, it's, it's a really complex uh, uh, question. And now next time, perhaps we can talk more about that. Yeah, well, uh, thank, thanks a lot. And, uh, and uh, uh, there's a question here also put forward by Katie Geliashvili, the, the open wound of Georgia, Abkhazia and, uh, and uh, Tsinvali regions. Um, how, how do you see these regions playing in, in this equation? Uh, um, obviously, they, they, are, they are an obstacle or they, they are a problem. And, uh, and, uh, and how serious an obstacle do you consider it to be in, 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 in Georgia's European uh, approximation process? Because much of the political attention might go there, economic resources. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, the, 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 the painful issue of uh, Abkhazia and, and Sinvali, how, how do you see this in the, in the EU, uh, EU equation? You're asking me, Edgar? Yeah, perhaps, perhaps you. Um, yes, uh, no, undoubtedly it is a very difficult and a painful uh, question. And I agree, uh, it is an obstacle and it is, put, it is precisely exists to be an obstacle. Um, I think uh, what has happened in 2008 was very much aimed at derailing Georgia's uh, Euro-Atlantic Process, process of your Atlantic integration and, uh, and by default now it also works with, with the EU. And if you draw a parallel with Ukraine, they're uh, similar. I mean, we have uh, seen it's the same pattern where while the, the causes of the conflict are um, and, and the roots are go long, far more into history and the beginning of the independence and uh, we cannot deny the importance of that. But I think these are all um, issues that with the right approach, uh, with uh, good instruments, with good intentions, we could have overcome. But unfortunately, uh, with the help of Russia, basically everything has been put in place in order to uh, make negotiated solution to this uh, conflicts uh, impossible. Uh, and, and that is, uh, of course, a huge uh, problem. Now, what can Georgia do? 
Uh, I think we can't do very much uh, directly, but we have to keep advancing. Georgia has to show to our citizens living in Abkhazia and Khinwali region that um, that they are part of us and we're moving towards something that is good. We're moving towards something that is uh, uh, in general uh, serves also their interests because we are trying to build the European style uh, democracy um, where human rights are protected, but not only where minority rights are protected, where we can be generous when it comes to self-rule, when it comes to uh, devolution, and their European experiences from different parts of Europe are extremely useful. I think these are all the messages that I think we have to cons consistently keep sending to, uh, to them so that they feel reassured and uh, and we have to sort of play on the power of attraction, which uh, I believe the EU has much stronger power of attraction. The, the European model, let's say, has much stronger power of attraction than, than the alternatives that they have right now. And what they have right now is the, is far from ideal. I don't think it is something that they have uh, necessarily dreamt of. So building, uh, building bridges of communication at different levels is uh, is much needed, but again, you know, you have basically the force standing there that disrupts it constantly. As soon as there is some communication, as soon as you know, we we send some positive messages, they are there to uh, to either uh, block it or stop it, or uh, with the propaganda machine that works uh, incredibly, particularly in this COVID times. Uh, that was just another example how effective they can be. Um, so it's it's a huge uh, issue, but um, but you know uh, what can we do? We have to we have to remain positive and we have to uh, follow the kind of vision that um, that is there. Um, yeah, thank well, you. If I, if I, yes, Sven. Yeah, please. Yes, if I if I if I may from the uh, add from the European perspective, obviously I, I very much agree with Natalie in that that uh, this issue was was created by Russia in order to be an obstacle, and when we look back to the uh, to to the uh, Russian aggression in two thousand eight, uh, it was in a, in in a way a response of Russia to the ongoing the discussions um, uh, regarding uh, the potential uh, of giving Georgia the membership action plan to to uh, advance towards uh, towards NATO when we look at the uh, Russian uh, occupation of eastern eastern Ukraine and, and the annexation of Crimea uh, that was a, a development triggered by the by the rejection of then uh, Ukrainian president uh, to of, of, of the association agreement with the European Union uh, against the will of, of, of Ukrainian people so that's uh, 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 that's the Russian Russian uh, way of, of trying to interfere and intervene in the in the uh, sovereign uh, sovereign decisions of, of sovereign states to to choose their own geo strategic uh, course and path uh, but um, uh, when I was well uh, in, 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 in NATO context, it is often said that that well, uh, uh, countries who seek membership should uh, should uh, try to resolve their uh, outstanding differences with the neighbors before seeking membership or before becoming members, and and a new country should not bring uh, additional conflicts or additional problems into the alliance, which I think is sort of uh, uh, logically contradictory because uh, I think it 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 would be uh, the other the other way to say it would be to say that that uh, countries should only seek membership in 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 uh, the atlantic alliance when they no longer need it and uh, that uh, i i think that each and every country who has who historically has uh, has has wanted to become member of of, of nato uh, has done so in order to to uh, uh, well, well or has done so because they perceived a a a deficit of security I don't. Uh, I, I don't think anyone has ever uh, wanted to become a member of the uh, alliance because they they had a surplus of security they wanted to share around. Uh, well, perhaps with the exception of the United States, but but that's a wholly different matter. And I think the same principle should apply to 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 uh, the European Union. If we say that no third country has a say. 
and and it's only between the the, the aspirant country and, and and the European Union to decide who who becomes or who doesn't become a member uh, then then we should that, that there is no append, appendix saying that unless a third country occupies a part of the territory of that country then they have a say I mean that that's that's uh, I think entirely entirely uh, co uh, contrary to the to, to, to the logic of of uh, uh, the membership uh, being a sort of sovereign decision by 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 any country so i think that that while obviously in practical terms it creates problems and 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 problems make it more difficult those problems make it more difficult uh to to uh, complete the reforms and and uh, uh well provide sort of internal stability uh it it should not uh, be an obstacle in a sense that that we say that that as long as russia uh, maintains a hold on 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 integral parts of the sovereign state of Georgia. Uh, membership is off the table. That's that, that that's that's not the way to to approach it. Yeah, very much. Uh, yeah, thank thanks a lot, uh, Sven. And uh, and we still have a few minutes left uh, in uh, in this discussion round. Uh, I think we have to address the very important question put forward also here by uh, Katie Geliashvili because. Um, the Friends of Georgia are carefully watching also the internal political developments in, uh, in Georgia. And, uh, and the EU brokered April 19 deal, well, provides a way out perhaps of this political uh, crisis. But then on the other hand, it's very fragile. So how, how would you describe the, the, the you know, the weeks now after the April 19 deal, how is Georgia kind of developing and, and what can be expected uh, in, the, in the months to come? Uh, because, I mean, if Georgia does not sort out the internal questions, then of course the, the uh, application put forward uh, in, in, in 2024 uh, would be practically meaningless because uh, you would uh, would not really consider it uh, seriously. Are you are you willing uh, to to discuss this, uh, Natalie? Maybe you first. Uh, yeah, thank you. It is of course interesting, and uh, this is what I mentioned when I said, uh, kind of in general terms, that uh, it, it's good to have a goal, but uh, it's also very risky if you reach the goal unprepared. Um, and uh, the crisis that we have witnessed obviously raised questions about the readiness of the general political elite uh, in Georgia for this. We, we have a, at the, at the moment, and this is the reality, we have a political uh, culture which is not exactly uh, in the standards of the kind of European, the way Europeans do politics. We, we, we should not only aspire um, to, uh, you know, joining the club and so on, but also do things in, a, in the same way. And this, first of all, concerns doing politics. Uh, there should be kind of a more uh, a, a culture of exchanging arguments and visions as opposed to uh, uh, to, to constant uh, accusations uh, and um, and a very low level of argumentation when it comes to the future development of the country. Uh, Georgians and we have mentioned I have mentioned it as well that the majority there is uh, support uh, European future there is one can say a broad consensus over this in the population. There is also a broad consensus over this in the political, uh, among the political players. And it is an incredibly wasted comparative advantage because these players cannot use uh, an agreement, uh, an overarching agreement without going into details. I mean, on, on achieving the ways and et cetera, there can be disagreement, but there is a, a principled agreement, right? And they cannot use it as a kind of unifying uh, driving force to present sometimes at least 
a kind of a common front when they come to Brussels, for example. At the moment, it's all about proving that one is better than the other. Um, and um, that, uh, that pushes us back. I think we, there are things that we have to learn to agree on and not to be afraid to, uh, uh, to say, okay, there, there is a division is shared and we have common objectives. Uh, and we may argue and disagree about the ways of achieving these objectives. Um, but at the moment, as I said, this, this huge advantage that, that there is huge support uh, of the population is not being used uh, as a motor to, uh, to um, advance uh, by all actors. Um, I believe it is a little bit early to talk about the, uh, the fallout of the agreement because now, first of all, it's, it's great that it uh, has taken place, uh, but we have to see the implementation and the implementation is very important. And if it is implemented properly, I think this, is a, uh, this can be a fundamentally uh, decisive agreement because there we're talking about a changing of the uh, election code, we're talking about judicial reform, and we're talking about power sharing in parliament. We don't have a tradition of this in Georgia. And as Georgia moves towards parliamentary, fully proportionally elected parliamentary system, without creating that tradition, it will be in crisis all the time. Uh, so this, this is a process. But for this, it also has to be conce conceived and perceived by all the actors as fair. And in that sense, the electoral reform is extremely important as well as uh, uh, judicial reform. So in, in, uh, in its content, it is an important agreement and we have to see whether there is enough resource uh, to, uh, to implement it and enough willingness by all sides to uh, uh, play according mm, the right kind of uh, rules. I think this is uh, this is a process that uh, that is uh, actually quite interesting and uh, perhaps, as I said, decisive in the transformation of uh, Georgia and the process of democratization. I'm I'm more hopeful, but uh, but it's um, uh, it's not an easy process. Uh, Sven, are you willing to comment on that? I would, I would say that uh, Georgian uh, internal politics obviously has been increasingly antagonistic over the past uh, several years, but that's not uniquely a uh, Georgian phenomenon. I think that, that we've seen sort of uh, uh, the, the, the um, more conf confrontational politics in, uh, in a, even much more uh, in, in countries that are generally considered to be much more sort of mature democracies. So it's, it's I, I think, a more, more uh, uh sort of uh, a, a broader broader broader, broader prob problem with the in in, in georgian case obviously we've had to this uh periodical escalations uh that we we had this uh june 19 events uh uh then we had the march 8 agreement before the before the uh parliamentary elections and then we had the boycott of the parliament and then another eu mediated agreement uh, that now is supposed to sort of uh uh, help the country to overcome these antagonisms. I think the, the, the political culture that Natalie uh, spoke about, that's a very important thing. I mean, um, what we do not want to have is a, a, a political culture where uh, the all important thing is achieving or retaining power. And where the parties basically uh, feel as, as if it's when, when we get to the power, uh, then we will figure out what to do with the power. Uh, what uh, we, we would like to see a culture where the where, where the competition is between the sort of different policy approaches and different uh, different ideas, and and I think that this agreement ideally should bring us closer to to, to this if properly implemented, as as, as Natalie said, and we've seen some uh, encouraging signs. I think the the uh, agreement between uh, the ruling party and part of the opposition regarding the the uh, the electoral uh, reform that's that's a very encouraging step. Uh, there are things that still remain to be uh, sort of figured out or hammered out, like the power sharing. I think that, that we, we, we will see whether the, the uh, ruling party and the opposition will be able to agree on the, on the arrangement and the timeline of power sharing. And, and then obviously the opposition among themselves will have to figure out as to how to divide those, those, those positions among themselves. And then the judicial reform obviously is a very 
uh, delicate issue. I think that there are significant differences there. There are also some sort of more uh, uh, fi fi finer details, like the how to how to uh, um, uh, sort of uh, bridge the differences regarding, for example, the the amnesty law, uh, and and uh, as to, so as to overcome these divisions. Uh, uh, Leading back to 19, uh, the summer of 19, uh, 2019, and 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 then obviously, I mean, the, we we have the run-up period, the run-up to the local election, which is potentially again uh, a very very difficult time because uh, political tensions are always high when when the, when the elections are approaching. But now the, this this election also serves as a plebiscite on the uh, on the on the uh, on, on the parliament in, in a way. So that's uh, if if the if the result is very close to this established threshold. I think it's 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 a potential for the, for 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 another escalation. So we'll 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 see. But uh, I, I think it's a, it's an important important uh, step. This this agreement obviously demonstrated the the high stakes that that the European Union attaches to to internal developments in Georgia and Georgia's relationship with the, with the European Union. Uh, so I'm I'm cautiously I'm cautiously hopeful. I would say. Uh, uh, dear friends, uh, I'm afraid we have used up the hour that was at our disposal. Uh, we, we started out with a more kind of general political background, but uh, we ended up with the, with the, to my mind, all important question of, of Georgia's kind of internal dynamics, because the key to, to Georgia's uh, uh, European aspirations on are partly in Brussels, but they are mostly, mostly still in uh, in, in Tbilisi. And uh, Estonians, as, as as you perfectly know, are, are are very much interested and willing to to help you in any way uh, we can. But yeah, the, the the homework, as it has been so so many boringly too many times repeated, uh, has to be uh, has to be done uh, done by Georgia. And uh, and when when Sven finished on a ca cautiously optimistic note, then then uh, then I, I'm also kind of very much looking forward to the day in Georgia, where either on the uh, on the kind of local level or, or uh, on the on the state level, Georgians are more willing to to engage in in uh, in. In, in coalition or of working together between parties, because as, as Natalie earlier uh, mentioned, the, the winner takes it all approach uh, is not really the way uh, Europe Europe sees things. Uh, so, my uh, dear, dear friends, uh, excellent speakers, Natalie Savanats and, and, and Sven Mixer, many many thanks for uh, for being with us today, and uh, and many thanks to uh, Rondeli Foundation for for providing this platform for, for sharing ideas. And, uh, and uh, as I actually, prior to opening this meeting already in a way privately mentioned to Sven and Natalie, then I think hopefully on the, thir uh, on the 3rd of uh, June, we can have another round of these discussions and uh, another former Estonian foreign minister and uh, member of Europe uh, European Parliament, uh, Marina Kailuren can share her uh, ideas uh, regarding uh, uh, Georgia and uh, and its uh, aspirations. So many thanks to everybody and looking forward to meeting you in, in, in further discussions. Thanks and have a good evening.